Uh, my name is Robert Stone. I am a candidate in the MFA program for photography and related media at the Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York, USA. Um, my work deals with themes of memory and communication and experience and uh, perceptions of, uh, of the way in which we think and, and communicate. And my current work uh, deals with that. Um, and it's nice to meet everybody. You know, my earliest memory of actually doing art, art, I guess would be just, um, I was, a, I remember being fascinated as a kid with pastels. Um, and I would, I would make these pastel drawings. Um, I'm not a very good, what I call hand artist. Um, so I'm not good at drawing and, and painting and things like that. But I remember being fascinated with the colors and, um, and making these, uh, you know, sort of pastel paint, uh, drawings and, and applying the coating. And I remember being fascinated with the materials that, um, the materiality of everything um, that I was able to utilize just as a little kid. Um, and then I didn't really start thinking about imagery as I do until I was probably maybe eight to 10 years old. And I discovered a camera in, um, in my father's attic um, you know, and I asked him like any young, young child might do is to teach me how to use it. And, um, and, and that sort of was my springboard. He took me to a, um, to, he was a scientist. So he was a physicist and a theoretical physical chemist. And so everything that he described to me was described in scientific terms. So he, he would explain to me about photons and light and how light would come into the lens and, um, and, that got me really interested in how, um, how you can manipulate imagery using light. Um, he would explain to me that I, well, we went to the park and I was trying to photograph this lion, but it was, it was a zoo. So it was like through the, the fencing and the fencing was getting in the way. And, you know, as a child, I was like, oh, I want to have a picture like as if it's in the, you know, in, in the wild. And, um, and so he explained to me that you could actually manipulate and, cause curvature of light around the fencing and basically making make it, make it disappear and um and so um, by manipulating the aperture and the lens and things like that you could do that and so um, i sort of became fascinated with that after um after that point of, of photographing with him and i just you know continued that path um, uh, photographing ever since so um along you know along my photographic journey i hadn't um, I hadn't really thought about school. I was very self-taught um, in all of my endeavors. And, um, and it wasn't until um, I was looking at some of the things I had done outside of the art world. Um, and, um, and I was, I was, um, I had been a trainer um, for a bank and I'd been, been set to teach people um, various policies and procedures and I had sort of a classroom environment and testing that I did and I sort of liked the idea of being able to share information with people and knowledge and that led me to think about my trajectory as an artist and as a photographer and I really wanted to share that knowledge with others and that that's sort of what led me on the path to go back to school and um, and and get my MFA at, at RIT in order to um, sort of share all that knowledge with others. I, I, I never really was interested in abstract early on in my like photo making career. Um, I um, And also, also I'm, not, um, I'm not a print maker, so, and that may be a language thing. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't use printing presses or anything like that in my work. Um, I mostly um, use traditional methods of printing uh, within a larger, and then I also do some pigment ink printing um, using uh, computer uh, and, and, and electronic printers. Um, and I, uh, I, it wasn't until I started looking at myself and looking at the way in which my mind thinks that I started to think about the abstract forms of, of or I wouldn't call them abstracts. I never really thought of my work as abstract. I thought of it more as these little pockets of moments of flashes of memory and thoughts and ideas that we have um, that are sort of disjointed. So it is an abstract in a way, but um, there, is a, there is a solid form to the imagery. The objects are identifiable, but the meaning is more nuanced. I certainly play with light. I think that um, I've always been fascinated with how 
light can both illuminate and subdue um, a particular area, but it's also how it subdues a particular thought or idea, you know, our perceptions of what, um, what we are observing are very much tied to the type of light that is being cast on that. Um, and, and that's true of, of life too, right? So our, our perceptions of our interactions with each other very much are tied to the way in which the, the surrounding environment is, is, is causing us to have that interaction and the surrounding things that are happening. And part of that is, is light and it could be light physically or the illumination of an idea. And, um, and so that, um, I think that, I think that that's sort of what, what draws me into the idea of utilizing light is the, the idea of thought and the idea of perception of, of an experience. I certainly work with all colors. Uh, it depends on what, what I'm thinking about in my project and what I'm sort of going after. My current work um, sort of utilizes color in a very, um, I don't know even what to call it. I guess I wouldn't call it oversaturated, but I wouldn't also necessarily call it subdued. Um, I think that it's a combination of the, the, the weight of what I'm trying to present as an emotional circumstance and um, the environment that it exists in. I like the idea that I can, to some extent, represent the reality of a situation, as well as to accentuate or reduce the, um, the feeling of an environment based on color usage and color pairing. I think that it's important to keep in mind that some of the work that I do is meant to be ultimately in book form, which means that the interplay between each image and the sequence that I ultimately choose will have an effect on how you see each color palette within that sequence um, and how they reference each other. Um, so I, that's sort of how I think about the colors within my work. So, I mean, I'm, I certainly find I'm very fascinated with the textures of things. I remember as a kid, um, I was very drawn, I didn't have good eyesight actually, I had really poor vision, and they didn't know this at first about me. Um, and so I remember being, sitting very close to the TV, as children do, so it didn't seem very, you know, outside of things. Um, and, but I was fascinated with both like the pixels themselves of like the individual, we had the old, the old TVs that were sort of rounded and had the, uh, the little pixels that were illuminated by the lasers inside the, the TV, right? And I remember seeing each, each color of the RGB and being really interested in how they used to glow and flash. Um, and then I also remember, I have this experience of me, my mom had a shag carpet, one of those old shag carpets. It was sort of this putrid green color. It was, it was terrible. But I remember staring at it because I could get so close to the actual carpet. I could see the individual fibers and I became very fascinated with the textures and the, the minute details of things. Um, and I think that that has sort of um, translated now that I have good vision and, you know, and things like that. Um, I think that I still, I still pull from that experience. So I've, I'm very fascinated with sort of the textures and, and that interplay of light and how light will affect how a texture appears to the viewer. Um, in my uh, a great deal. <laughs> um, in particular, the work that I'm doing now. Um, uh, prior to the pandemic, I was working on a series that had to do with me staying with people. Um, I was staying with families and individual uh, people for in their home environments for 24, 48 hours generally. You know, it depended on the on the um, on the um, on the particular person and what they had time for. Um, but I would stay with them and I was just photographing sort of their daily lives and everything that they encountered and experienced. Um, and I thought that it was an attempt to relate people to each other. Um, there's so much hostility and anger that I see in the world. And I wanted to show people that we're sort of all the same in a way. And so my investigation led me to this place where I was photographing these just minute details of everyday life, but that were sort of unique to the individual. And I used to think that that was, um, that was my way of sharing with the world how both unique and similar we could be. 
And then the pandemic hit and I was forced to reassess what I was doing with my work. Um, I was no longer allowed access to those homes for safety reasons. And I had to start looking inward at myself. And what I discovered was that part of, um, part of my interest in relating to other people and observing others was my difficulty in communication that I have with others. Um, I, I think in, um, there's, a, there's a kind of mindset that has to do with thinking in pictures. I don't think in words, my thoughts are actually images and flashes of images. And I didn't really realize that until I sort of delved into the research of it all, which is also part of the program. Um, but then I looked back at my previous work and I realized that there's a disconnect that I have with these subjects that I was observing. And part of that barrier is the fact that I thought that maybe I could communicate in picture form rather than verbally communicate those words and thoughts and ideas. And, um, and so, so my experiences with others and my interactions with others very much affected the way that I photograph, even without me knowing it. Um, and I've only sort of recently come to that um, realization. Um, well, in terms of um, again, as far as my perception is, printmaking is sort of a different art than photographic print creation. So just, I want to be clear with that. Um, but in terms of the, the new, new processes, um, certainly um, the, 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 the modern um, HP and Epson and Canon printers that are digitalized printers are sort of the mainstream printing products. They all have a mixture of some kind of ink that also has pigment into, mixed into it um, so that there's a, a lasting color presence and that, that that light shown on those inks as age happens um, has less effect on them so they last very long. And um, this sort of object permanence that um, persists in the art world, um, you know, is just sort of perpetuated in this new kind of printing environment. You know, we used to go into the dark room and print with silver and silver as a material is, um, is a metal. And so it itself lasts a long time and there, there's a preservation to that. Um, but now we have these pigment inks and we're sort of, we're drawing on the oldest technology, right? If, especially in France, right? You have the caves um, that have all of those pigments of the hands, that were sprayed on with the with the um, with the natural um, pigment um, uh, dust that existed at the time, and we're sort of reinventing that and reapplying it to new processes now. So so there's sort of it's sort of like harkening back to the first pieces of art in a way, um, and I think that's really fascinating that we we found a new way to make something that is so old and ancient and powerful into something new that is a, a lasting permanence, which kind of speaks to the way humanity is always trying to, um, to make themselves last, which I think in itself is fascinating that we, we want to be remembered. Um, and I guess in a way as photographers, we want to be remembered. <laughs>
um, especially at RIT, they have prepared me for the art world. There are um, huge introductions to the art world, um, ways in which we have connected with gallerists and with other artists and had reviews and been connected to, to, to that world. And so we're playing on, we're both, we're both connecting to the research that we have to do as, as a, as a MFA program that is research-based, as well as the image-making process in which we're connecting with artists and getting reflections of what the art world um, and what our future careers will, will entail. And they very much do a good job of pairing what we as, as students want to do going forth with, um, with each student. So, you know, I want to teach, but I also want to be an artist. And so I've been introduced to both, um, I, I, I have classes that I teach every semester um, as a teacher, so I'm already doing my job going forward, as well as um, the fact that I am being introduced to gallery owners and to um, um, successful photographers in the world and being able to get feedback from them um, in a way that, that connects me to my next steps. So um, it actually hasn't been as difficult of a balance as I think, as, as it might appear because of the way that RIT structures um, our ability to access that world, um, which I'm very grateful for. Actually both, um, um, we, have, um, we have a thesis uh, or a thesis, that, a thesis paper that is very much also a combination of a thesis and an ex what they call an extended artist statement. Um, and so we are combining the research that we've done over the course of our studies um, and combining that with an extended version of an, what an artist statement might be. Um, normally artist statements are sort of condensed and shortened. And so this is, um, is a research-based paper that we then cut down um, and assimilate into just a, a shortened, um, you know, 20 page paper, um, rather than it being a full thesis that's a larger, um, larger chunk it. But we have done that research and then we have to cut it down so that it's condensed into uh, more of an artist's statement rather than it being a full thesis paper, even though we've done the work. And then we also do a defense. And normally that's done in person um, as, a, as, a, as the pandemic, we're also assembling um, these as presentations just to be sure we have cover our bases. And going forward, those presentations are also useful in terms of doing, doing presentations about our work um, going forward. But we do our defense and we defend our work and explain and justify what we've done. And a board will then have a meeting um, to decide if we pass or not. And so there's, it's very much the same kind of thing as, as other programs that are um, more research-based where you have, you have that defense and they could say no. They could tell me that I need to do more work and they need to go back and spend another year doing more research. So um, there's, a, there's definitely um, a lot expected from the program. Um, you know, access to information was always my, my guide. My curiosity, I think, was, was, was heavily into that. Um, I am I'm a very curious person. You know, like I, I mentioned, my father was a, a scientist. And my whole family on my father's side were sort of all scientist-based. My, my father and my grandfather were both also engineers. And my great-grandfather was a tool and die maker. And so I was very very fascinated in understanding how things worked. And I sort of took that into the art world in terms of understanding the nuance and, and fascination with all the ways in which we can um, sort of illuminate things within the world that we want to speak about. And so I got drawn into um, being invested in my curiosity. And, and following that trail of thought and following that thread to, to grow as an artist. And that led me to a place where I needed to go back to school. I needed to get, I, I learned enough on my own and I hit a plateau where I needed to learn from someone else. 
And um, you can do that in many ways. There are ways to apprentice with other, other artists and things like that. Um, but I chose the academic path um, and I'm, I'm very grateful for all that I've learned. I think that, you know, me memory and perception is, I guess, what I would say. Um, I, I photograph in a way in which I am presenting, I am responding to the world. I'm responding to what I am observing and then wanting to share that with others. But those images, those moments in time are fixed and I cannot... They are, they are in retrospect when I am presenting them. And so they are a memory. And sharing a thought and a memory and idea um, with others and with, a, with those who are observing my work is sort of, I guess, part of my theme. Um, and communicate, and finding a way to communicate these sort of nuanced details with, with others, it's a challenge. Um, but I think that that's sort of the theme um, or, or the thread that I, that I try to follow. I don't know if that answered the question or not. Yes. So, I mean, uh, so, so we also have a thesis show, so we have to also present the work in a, in a gallery environment, um, and, um, you know, profess our new the, uh, our, our new work to the world. Um, and so, um, I actually have a show April uh, 2nd, which is my thesis show. Um, where I'll be presenting um, um, a few of my pieces along with the other artists in my program. And um, we're really excited to be able to do it in person. Um, it's going to be very limited access, um, you know, for safety reasons. But, um, but, um, but yeah, no, it's at a gallery downtown. Um, it's a very large gallery. I'm very excited about it. Um, it's a beautiful space and we've all um, worked well together to find the best place within a gallery for each of our works. Um, I've been very fortunate to have a, a group of people that work really well together um, as a cohort. And I think that that's also part of things, you know, artists need to, I'm sorry if I'm on a tangent here, but artists need to sort of find people that they get along with and support each other. Um, you know, they say that no person is an island. And I think that's very true. You need to find yourself a support system and a way to come up together as a group. And I'm very fortunate to have that. Um, and um, and I, we've also spoken about having additional shows um, uh, together in the future, um, depending on how our work fits together. You know, so there's there's some of us that sort of have similar similar themes, and so we've talked about doing. Uh, um, shows together as a like two a two person show that kind of thing. Um, I've also had some success. Um, I have some publications that are that have come out and or are coming out. Um, one, uh, uh, two two um, uh, collections in uh, in books that I've had last last year. Um, I have a magazine that's coming out, um, an international magazine that's coming out. Um, I believe this month. I'm not allowed to talk about it until it, it's published, unfortunately, so I can't even tell you which uh, magazine it is, but, um, but it's an international magazine, so uh, in print, which is very exciting, especially in times like these. You know, I used to. Um, I, uh, I spent almost a decade, uh, you may, may or may not know this, but I spent almost a decade in the movie industry, um, and so I'm very much, uh, I, I very much was drawn to the aesthetic of the cinematic image. Um, I really loved the idea of um, almost having these strange, odd sets of human interaction. And in looking back on things, it's sort of like a cinematic version of um, the kind of work that I did in my home project where I was observing people in the home. But in a more... Um, very carefully lit, very um, sort of, um, I, I use the word cinematic because I don't have a better name for it. Um, uh, strange, odd feeling of a mood or a moment within a scene. And I was very much drawn to that. Um, and it wasn't until I sort of became more exposed to ideas of deeper, deeper meanings within images and sort of metaphorical work that I, I grew as an artist and I grew in my appreciation for different kinds of art. 
So I mentioned that I didn't feel that my work was abstract because I feel like abstract work um, takes it a step further than my own. Um, there's one of my cohort now that um, she's doing abstract work that relates to um, relates to her skin. And so she's actually utilizing the materiality of um, photography to, to um, relate to her actual skin and, and problems with her skin. And so she's using that in a very sort of what I consider abstract way, um, ripping apart the material and things like that. And I didn't used to like that work. Um, not her work, I just mean that kind of work in general. And through education and understanding more of the deeper meaning and historical context of those kinds of things, um, I've found a new appreciation for that work. And so my, my reach and my understanding and my appreciation of the broader context of photography has really grown. And so I don't have the same favorite that I used to. Um, uh, so I, it, it becomes harder to answer that question. It's sort of like when you start to listen to more music and your, your, your range of mu musical artists broadens and then you can't say, oh, my favorite music is alternative or modern because it, it's, it's a plethora. darkroom photography um, there are very much safety protocols that they didn't used to have um, that have made darkroom much safer um, and um, you know wearing gloves and also having the proper ventilation that takes away any potential chemical um, that might um, be damaging to the lungs or harmful um, skin irritants have been often removed from a lot of the chemicals, so they found new chemicals that are a lot safer for the environment um, that will break down and not damage the environment. So um, there are newer, um, newer developers and chemicals that um, are safer. Um, there are some hazards still. We still set aside, for example, the fixer. Um, it's a, a chemical that will contain some of the silver particles. Um, you can then um, basically electrify that and remove the silver from the chemical so that it is safer again and re-harvest re that silver to be utilized again. Um, and so there's, they're finding ways to sort of um, to, to make things as safe as possible. Um, there's always some amount of risk if you are not careful um, I think that proper procedure and, you know, I know this is like the boring part because it's all scientific, but the proper procedures and following protocols is very important. And, um, and if you're a sloppy worker, pulling back on that and really um, paying attention to what you're doing and being careful about all that really changes um, the safety within that work. Um, I, I, and again, I, I can't speak to printmaking them itself, but I do know that there, uh, um, we have been introduced to some of the printmaking studios at the school and they are working with some um, new kinds of materials that don't contain the same kinds of uh, poisonous cadmium that they used to in some of the paints and things like that um, that they used to use. So there are, there are better procedures um, for some of them. So. <laughs> um, you know, I've, I've, um, I've very much been looking at different schools and, um, and, and countries. Uh, I, I don't necessarily need to stay in the US. Um, I've actually been looking, looking at applying to a bunch of schools out of, out of the country. Um, it all depends on how the pandemic is and if those countries even allow people to ha be visiting artists and visiting photographer, teachers uh, or professors. Um, because of the, the, the pandemic climate, but I would love to um, be able to um, sort of both 
share the knowledge that I've learned here, as well as be introduced to other ways of um, image making um, by exposing myself to other artists in other countries. So I think that it would be wonderful to do, um, you know, visiting artists, professor positions um, in, in other universities around the world. That would be one I should say, and residencies as well. <laughs> Once you leave the academic setting, you, you don't have someone else motivating you. So if you're not self-motivated, you, you might stumble and struggle a little bit to find a direction. And I think that that probably plays into the, the self-taught autodidactic kind of person who, um, who is, is motivated and curious and I saw something recently that spoke about the, the fact that curiosity and following that curiosity and forcing yourself to um, really unravel those threads, um, you know, is a way to, to really um, push yourself forward. Um, and I appreciated that thought. And, and I, I, I uh, very much think um, that. So I think about him a lot. Um, and, um, you know, I think about him because of his his. Um, relationship to me you know I think there's a bond that we always form with parents my mother is, is, is around and I have a great relationship with her um, she's been very supportive of my work and um, and so I don't mean to not speak of her I, I, I sort of left her out um, and she she taught me a lot about um, she taught me a lot about crafting in a different way she was always she was the one who introduced me to pastels and things like that and she was always um, you know, delving into various hand art. And so I think that um, my ability to manipulate prints in the darkroom and that materiality that I deal with probably actually, that part probably stems from her introduction to sort of being uh, very ingenuitive um, with all of my, um, you know, um, little things that I used to make. Um, and so I think that that's sort of nice, nice to think about. But um, yeah, my father was very academic um, and and uh, scientific, and so I think that I think about the fact that he would appreciate where I am and the research that I've done, and the sort of the academic side of of um, of the work that I'm that I'm making, um, and um, and so I think that he'd be proud a scientist. Of my father and was very direct. He understood. He was a genius. Um, his his IQ was off the charts. It was it was like I don't know one fifty eight I think. Um, and and he just understood certain aspects of the world. But the one thing that he wasn't good at was the same thing that I struggle with, which is communication. Um, I think that there's something about certain people's brains, um, and it very much relates to where you are in the spectrum and things like that. That that the way that you communicate is different. And being able to observe both how he struggled with communication and how I struggle with communication has enabled me to sort of see the world in a different way. And, um, and that combined with the thinking in pictures and the way that I think in, in imagery um, has sort of led me to this point where I'm creating this conversation with the viewer through imagery rather than through words. Um, and that is, that's really where my, where my strength comes in. And, um, and, and I'm finally found a way to communicate in my terms and in my way. And, um, and I think that that's really special. And I owe part of that to uh, my father and understanding um, where he came from and the way that he taught me. So I think I have, I think I have two different messages. The first message related to sort of what you're talking about is that um, I think that um, we are so used to being bombarded by imagery in a on a screen. Um, and so there is sort of an impermanence to that. Um, you know, we're, we're constantly uh, being uh, hit with dopamine response because of the feed. Right, we swipe, we we swipe down, and we look and look and look. We swipe up and, and keep going and going and going down this feed, and we're being bombarded by so much, either by advertising or just by our own um, inherent impatience with the scroll. And I think that there is a, something to be said for the power of materiality of the print and of of something that becomes permanent and physical that um, you can't get from a screen. 
Um, and I think that it's something that will become its own form of art as we move forward and, and become more as technology changes. And I mean, someday there may be three dimensional prints out there that are, that are um, you know, either virtual or, or physical. And I think that there, there is a, um, there's a power to that um, time that we take to invest in a single image. Um, I, I notice with the students that I have now in the dark room that they aren't used to physically manipulating anything. And so there's a sort of moment where they're confronted with the idea that they have to physically, not, it's not digital anymore. They have to physically manipulate something with their hands. And at first it's a challenge because it's not something that they're used to doing. And then they fall into the magic of it all. And it becomes something that they've they've invested more time in, and they've physically done, and so it becomes a, an extension of themselves in a way of their own work and of their own emotions and persona and struggles and strife as they continue to try to um, to make the best print that they can. And I think there's something magical about that and special, and I think that that's something that's really important. Um, I mentioned that there were two things that I felt that were important. And I think the second one, if I have one final, if this is the end of the interview and I have one final message, I think that my message is not just in listening to the images and sitting with images to think, to think about what they could mean and to learn historically the context of what they might mean, but also to listen to each other. I think that we have been confronted with so much, um, so much, upset the past few years. And it all comes from the fact that we're not listening to each other. Um, we're only listening to ourselves in this digital environment. We only get bombarded with the things that we are liking and we are only hearing one side of things. And there are so, uh, the world is so diverse. And if we sit down and start to listen to each other, listen to people who aren't like ourselves and don't look like us and can um, really truly listen and, uh, and, and agree that their perspective is different than our own, but that their perspective is valid and that what they're saying is true, we can grow as people and we can grow together and be better humans together. And I think that that is, that's part of what my message is in terms of my work, even though my work doesn't immediately speak to that. It's about, it's about listening to, um, it's about listening to each other and communicating in a different way. And, and I think communicating with each other is really important. And it's, it's a value that I think we've lost as a society and I'd like us to get back to that. So that's, that's my final thought.